Hey everybody, um, thank you for coming today. My name is Sai Alba. I'm a partner at Polaro Maza and the Government Contracts Group. Uh, Polaro, but just to go over uh, briefly, uh, Polaro Maza is a uh, mainly a we're government contracts firm, but we represent a number of small, mid-sized companies and some large companies as well, and with various uh, issues ranging from clearly government contracting through labor and employment, some litigation, uh, and also a lot of general corporate matters. So that's sort of what we do. Uh, I'm a partner of the Government Contracts Group, focusing uh, almost exclusively on federal contracts issues. Uh, and I'm here with my colleague, Kimi Murakame, who is in the corporate group. Uh, we're going to start on the data rights issues. And you know, Kimmy, I think, is going to take the lead going through here, and I'll chime in on various issues. Uh, we hope this will be a good presentation for everyone, because I know this can be a confusing topic, but we're hoping that it will be a little more clear at the end of all this. And if there's anything we haven't hit, uh, please let us know. We'll be answering everyone's questions either now during the presentation or afterwards. And also let us know if there's issues and topics that you're interested in that we haven't gotten to or if you'd like to see something exclusive on, say, just software or just patent rights, things like that, which uh, we're thinking about doing in the future as well. So this is more of a general overview of the data rights issues, and we can get into more specifics uh, with questions or as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. So data rights issues for government contractors can be resolved by asking several questions, and it's that analysis that will guide how we're going to present present today's materials. So the first question we look at is, are we talking about a civilian or defense contract? Um, if it's civilian, uh, we're going to be looking at the regulations under the FAR, or if you're doing work for uh, a defense contract, it will be under DFARS. Uh, the next issue uh, we start looking at is, what type of data are we talking about? Is it technical data? or are we talking about computer software? And each of these questions we're going to go into uh, in more detail as we go through the presentation. The next question we start looking at is what kind of rights, uh, based upon whether or not uh, we're doing civilian work or defense work and the type of data, then we'll start looking at what kinds of rights are involved. There could be limited rights, restricted rights, unlimited rights, government purpose rights, or inchoate rights. The next part uh, of our analysis involves when was the software actually developed. And when we talk about developed, we're talking about when that item or component or process became workable. And workability generally occurs when a reasonable person skilled in the applicable act concludes that there is a high probability that the item or process will work as intended. So the key here is when was that software developed? Uh, before uh, you were awarded the government contract or after? And again, we're going to get into more facts um, related to that. Yeah, and you know, all, all of this stuff is important, whether you're dealing with um, software or technical data. When you're talking about when the thing was quote unquote developed is is critical because that's when the rights attach whether it's the contractors reservation of rights or the government's taking of additional rights it all attaches when that key period of development occurs if it's if the development occurs under the federal contract when the government is paying for it then that's when all these rights we're going to talk about attaches if development occurred under private expense before or after the federal contract, then that's when the rights attach as well. So that's what matters when you're looking at who's who has what rights. And so we'll get into more of that, that in a minute, but that's why this is critical. Um, and one of the other questions that's very important is who actually funded the development? Um, who paid for it? What is the source of the funding? And what we're looking at here is whether or not it was at private expense, meaning the contractor paid for it, or whether it was government funded, which means development that wasn't accomplished exclusively or partially at private expense. And then we'll also be talking about mixed funding, where there's a little bit of both. 
So going back and looking in more detail at each of these questions, the first, as I mentioned, is what kind of work are you performing, civilian or defense contracts? Um, if it's civilian, uh, then you're going to be looking at the data rates clauses under the FAR, and we've given you the citations there. And if it's defense work, it's going to be under the DFARS. Often we're asked, how do these work together? And the answer to that is that they don't. These are completely separate uh, data rights provisions based upon what kind of work that you are performing. Uh, you're not trying to uh, bring any resolution to them. You're keeping them distinct. Um, also, the reason why that's very important is there are differences under the FAR and DFAR. Uh, as one example we've given here, if the development occurred with mixed funding under the DFARs, then the government would attain government purpose rights. But under the FAR with mixed fund funding, the government would have unlimited rights. And again, these are, um, I think a lot of your questions we're anticipating will have to do with uh, different kinds of facts, but we're going to go through all of these and we can get to those kinds of questions. But this is just one example of showing you the differences uh, under the FAR and the DFAR. And sometimes what you'll see is the government mistakenly include both the FAR and the DFAR provisions, and they are in kind of utter conflict with one another, and that's something that, that should be raised and corrected because it's, it's actually impossible to reconcile the two because they're meant to be two completely separate and distinct regimens. Um, even some of the nomenclature used and the legends that you're supposed to put on the, the items, which we'll get into later, are completely different, so uh, it's just very important to keep the distinction. So once we know what kind of work you're trying to perform, we start looking at what kinds of data are we talking about. Is it technical data or is it computer software, which could be commercial or non-commercial software? Are we discussing the databases or are we talking about computer software documentation? And we're now going to get kind of down in the weeds and talk about the actual definitions for each of these uh, types of data. So we've outlined here for you, uh, directly from the regulations, what technical data means. Uh, under the FAR and the DFAR, they're somewhat similar that they mean recorded information, regardless of how recorded, of a scientific or technical nature. Uh, it doesn't include computer software or financial administrative cost or price or management type data, that type of information that's related to co contract administration. Computer software, what we're talking about here, and we've quoted uh, from the FAR, it's computer programs that comprise a series of instructions or rules that allow or cause a computer to perform a specific operation. It's recorded information comprising source code listings, design details, algorithms, processes, and related material that enable the computer program to be produced, created, or compiled. But this does not include computer databases or computer software documentation. So that's not included in the definition of computer software. But generally, computer databases and software documentation can be complete, com, com, or can be contained in the technical data definition. So that's where these things sort of mix a little bit, is when you're talking about computer software, where you have databases that are created through the software, or the documentation to run the software. Um, that can be complete, can, can be included in the, the technical data side of the regulations. Another important distinction here is whether or not you're talking about commercial or non-commercial -com computer software. The definition of commercial computer software we've outlined for you here means software developed or regularly used for non-governmental purposes which has been sold, leased, or licensed to the public, or offered for sale, lease, or license, or has not been offered, sold, leased, or licensed, but will be available for commercial sale, lease, or license in time to satisfy the delivery requirements of the contract. Or it is software that satisfies one of the above and requires only minor modifications to meet the requirements of the contract. And, and to be commercial computer software, which then there's a completely different standard and different requirements uh, apply, different legends, everything. 
and this can be beneficial to you because when you're talking about commercial computer software, the rights that you're allowed to withhold from the government can be the same rights that you would withhold from anyone purchasing the item on the general commercial marketplace. So that allows you more latitude in structuring your license rights versus non-commercial computer software or non-commercial like technical data. Um, and so what's just important about here is that in order to qualify and you be able to use whatever license you generally would like to use, you have to meet one of these sort of three criteria, two and a half kind of criteria. So if you do not meet these criteria, it is not commercial. It cannot be commercial software. And so then you have to fall under the non-commercial clauses and use the very particular language in the FAR or the DFARS uh, to, to uh, ensure that your rights are protected. You cannot use your general license. Okay, so the next step in the analysis is what type of rights do you have based upon whether or not we're talking about technical data or computer software. Um, and so these, here is an outline of the different kinds of rights that we're going to talk about. There can be limited rights, restricted rights, unlimited rights, government purpose rights, or inchoate rights. And we're going to go into each of those now. Just to be clear, what we're talking about here is the government getting a license. A license is permission to engage in otherwise restricted activities. What we are not talking about here is the government getting ownership. Ownership or title is always going to remain with the contractor. So the rights we're describing here, the license rights, are for both civilian and defense procurements. I, going back to what we talked about before, are we talking about the FAR or the DFARS? And it applies to both commercial technical data and to computer software. With regard to the ownership, this is just a question we, we get a lot. Um, that's sort of the general rule is that the purpose of all of these clauses was put in place years ago is to try to spark some commercial development in the broader economy, right? So they don't, the government isn't in the business of owning things. While it might save the government money down the line, the purpose behind all these clauses is, is actually the opposite of what the government would maybe like to do uh, just in a broader big G, the general government would like to do in times like this where there's sort of an economic crunch, especially in the federal space, is they'd like to take ownership of things in order to save money down the line. But the, the reason this entire regulatory scheme was put in place was actually to reverse that from happening. Mm -hmm. The government used to take rights in, used to take ownership rights rather quite often. And while that's all well and good for the government, it, it didn't spark the same economic development that could be happening. And so the way this, this developed is if the government takes license rights to use something, but the uh, contractor keeps the rights to commercialize it, then for the economy as a whole, for the development of future technology, it they thought it would, it would blossom. And so that's sort of the point behind all of these regulations and all of these rules. And you know, it's worked pretty effectively given some of the projects that have been out there recently. Um, but that's definitely the, the idea behind these regulations and the current environment are really butting heads. And so it's just something, whether you're the contractor side or you're the government side, to, to think about. Because, you know, you might be getting, the government might be getting a lot of pressure from the higher ups or whatever to start taking ownership or start asserting its rights more aggressively. But the fact of the matter is that that's not the way this is supposed to be done. And it was done purposefully this way to effectuate sort of the opposite result, um, which, which is just something in this day and age that we should really think about. And that's actually been codified, which we'll get into in, in a minute. Right. So exactly as Sai was just saying, to provide a little just of the historical backdrop, if you will, prior to 1980, the government did take ownership in government-funded inventions. Um, but as Sai was describing, this didn't encourage commercialization. And that's why in 1980, under the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, the government or the Department of Commerce uh, was allowed to have patent rights clauses to be included in agreements uh, when they were providing federal funding with nonprofit organizations or specifically universities and small businesses. So the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980 really changed the landscape here 
uh, with, resca- with regard to these rights. And in addition, you know, the, with regard to the small business piece in particular, the Buy Dole Act prohibits um, prime contractors from sort of e- taking forcefully or extorting or however that might, you know, however you want to put it, certain rights from their subcontractors. But it does not prohibit the subcontractors, the small business subcontractors, from willingly uh, giving rights to the prime contractor. And so that's just something to to think about whether you're the small business sub or you're a larger business prime. Um, you're not supposed you're only supposed to be taking the rights that you you have to take in the product in order to get things done. And in fact, we'll get into it in a little bit, there's provisions in the DFARS especially that suggest that prime contractors should not take rights from a small business and they should just uh, give the government direct access to the subcontractors, at least with regard to the license rights. Not getting the work done, not communications with the government or anything like that, just with regard to the license rights. And so that all came out of the buy dole Act and uh, sort of its progeny. And one important uh, case that we just wanted to mention, also um, staying in this historical background, if you will, is the Stanford v. Roche case. This was a Supreme Court opinion that came out in 2011, and this came down to agreements that an inventor had signed uh, with its, a university, uh, but also with a company. And it came down to some language that we just wanted to bring up here, just as making sure we're providing some practical advice, particularly almost like a trap, if you will, um, if not being careful. And what happened here was that in one of his agreements, the one with the company, um, the inventor, there was language that said the inventor hereby assigns and will assign. Whereas in contrast, in his other agreement with the university, it just said he would assign in the future. He promises to assign uh, anything he had invented um, at a later time. In the latter case, that language was not strong enough, and that's why we always want to make sure, and you should check your contracts, uh, employment agreements, and other documents when you're talking about inventions to make sure that the inventor is actually making a firm commitment in the present to hereby assign. And this is really important to make sure, in light of this case, that you have that affirmative language to effectuate a proper transfer. Yeah, exactly. Because if you if you just say that the person will assign all their rights, which a lot of agreements say, that's them promising to do something in the future. And if you don't actually follow up and make them do it in the future, then you're not reserving your rights. And it actually stays with them. So when they leave to go to another company, this thing that they've created under your employment is actually their property. So normally everything's sort of a work for hire, but you have to have the right language in your agreements um, with, with your employees to make sure you actually, the company, gets the rights, not the individuals. Okay, so going back to the different kinds of rights that apply and um, as we've been describing, the first type of right we're going to talk about is limited rights. When we're talking about limited rights, this term only applies to technical data. So that's why it's so important to determine what you're actually talking about. Are you talking about commercial software or technical data? And if we're talking about technical data, um, what would come into play is limited rights. This having limited rights is the most protection that a contractor can get for its technical data which is developed at private expense. Um, in other words, this is technical data that's come into being or is workable prior to the performance of the contract that the contractor has paid for prior to there being government funds used to develop the technical data. Uh, we set forth here from the regulations, uh, limited rights, Uh, What actually does the government get when it has limited rights? Uh, Within the government, it can use, modify, release, perform, display, or disclose technical data in whole or in part, um, but it cannot use that technical data for manufacturing. Um, 
Further, it cannot release or disclose technical data outside of the government. Yeah, and the, the caveat actually to the release outside of the government is that if there's certain covered contractors, support contractors, like the people who might uh, do some maintenance work for things, or if they have another contract to, um, you know, maybe transfer software, certain databases, or there's some sort of emergency situation, an emergency repair that has to take place to either hardware or software, um, that is excluded from, from this. In an emergency, the government can give it to a third party uh, sort of without telling you or anything because it's an emergency. Uh, they should get some sort of non-disclosure agreement or ensure that they're protecting your rights. If you have lim if you gave the government limited rights, they should protect it to the fullest extent possible. But if it's an emergency, they can give it to a support contractor to fix whatever the problem has to be. If then that support contractor does something with your data, you could you could sue the government um, for for that breach. Then if it's not an emergency, they can still release it outside of the government to limited covered support contractors to fix things or in a non-emergency situation or to otherwise support sort of hardware or software requirements that they might have. But outside of the emergency context, they then have to notify you before they do it and give you the opportunity to enter into an, a non-disclosure agreement with this support covered support contractor. So um, that's just sort of a caveat to, to be aware of. But this is the most restrictive rights you, you can offer the government, including if you have a commercial contract and uh, you're generally giving the government whatever the commercial license happens to be, they cannot accept less in the commercial license than they could under the limited or restricted rights clauses, depending on which applies in the given situation. The next right we're going to talk about is restricted rights. So restricted rights applies when we're talking about computer software, non-commercial computer software as I just described. Uh, restricted rights is for both civilian and defense contracted contracts, um, and it's the most protection that a contractor can get for computer software developed at private expense, just like we just described limited rights that a contractor can get for technical data. And th this isn't just semantics either, because different clauses, whether it's the FAR or the DFAR, or e those are the main ones, even certain agency level uh, um, cl clauses and, th and things like that. But generally speaking, in the FAR and the DFAR, the restricted rights and the, the limited rights seem to be similar, but they're not identical. And the uh, licenses and things that are given and the legends that you have to put on things are different. So while some of this stuff may seem like semantics, it's not. It's actually important to keep things separated so you know the right clauses are in your contracts and you know what legends and things like that you're supposed to put on all your, uh, your data and your software. So if the government has restricted rights, what can they do? If there are restricted rights in computer software, the government can use a computer program with one computer at one time. The program may not be accessed by more than one terminal unless permitted by the contract. The government can transfer to another agency without further permission of the contractor, but only if the transfer destroys all the copies of the program and related computer software documentation in its possession. And it must also notify the licensor of the transfer. And that's another, that's a piece where that's why it's important to separate the limited rights versus the uh, restricted rights in software because with the limited rights, they could in theory transfer things and they don't have to necessarily destroy it if it's within the government. Whereas under the software clauses, they're not supposed to maintain more than one copy of the software or more than the license would allow. Obviously, major enterprise licenses and things like that, they could have 500 licenses, but they're, if they want to give another agency or division, one of those 500, if it's already in use, they have to uninstall it from the computer, erase it, and just let the new user use it. This, it's just like any, any commercial business, just like if you were using it for your own company. The next type of right is government purpose rights. 
These are mainly used in defense contracts. Uh, it also applies to both non-commercial technical data and computer software developed with mixed funding. And it allows the government to use the data internally and externally for government purposes. Yeah, and the, the, what, what's interesting here about government purpose rights is this actually really would only come up in pretty limited circumstances because it only attaches, let me get this, no, it only really attaches in mixed funding scenarios like, like Kimmy just said. And what that means is that at the point of development, which we defined earlier, so when it's sort of been reduced to practice, that there was joint funding to create that item. And that's down to the lowest practicable level where you can segregate um, the government funded and the private funded items. So if you have a piece of software or some sort of technical data that half of it was developed at private expense and half of it was developed at government expense, that is not mixed funding. That is where half of it you could have restricted rights if it's software or limited rights if it's technical data. You could take that in the part that you developed at private expense, where the half that was at government expense, the government would have unlimited rights in that part of it. So if you could segregate it like that, that's the way it's separated. It's only if you cannot segregate the item and you contemporaneously through development put your own money into it and government money into it and you cannot segregate where that money went and what was developed with that money. That's the only time that really government purpose rights are going to attach. Otherwise, it's either going to be restricted or limited, and on the other side, unlimited. So the government purpose is a very narrow scope, and I you don't really see it come up that much um, with certain IT work and things like that. There might be other areas where it comes up more often, but it's sort of the least important uh, to, to really understand for most companies. Okay, so like Sai said, on the other side, uh, we've talked about restricted rights, limited rights, maybe government purpose rights a little bit in the middle, and then on the other side is the unlimited rights. So this is the broadest amount of rights the government might get here. And the, we, this applies in both civilian and defense contracts. It applies to both technical data and software developed under the government contract. And effectively allows the government to do whatever it wants with the data. While the government can do that, it's important again to keep in mind that unlimited rights are not exclusive rights and the contractor will still be free to license and you still retain ownership. One thing, though, is if the government takes unlimited rights, then it has the ability to transfer those unlimited rights to third parties. So if it contracts with another company to do certain work, and let's say it has unlimited rights in a, a piece of software and you were required to deliver the source code, then in that case, it has the right to distribute the source code to another contractor in order to get other work done or say a follow-on contract or something something like that. Um, and so that's a pretty powerful right that it has. Now you still, like Kimmy said, you still retain ownership. And so you could commercialize it, you could develop it your, yourself, but the unlimited rights could be transferred to another contractor to do certain things with it. Um, at least vis-a-vis -vis the government. So uh, it's just something to really keep in mind then to the extent you can segregate pieces of whatever it is you're giving to the government to say, no, 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 this was mine. I developed this at private expense. You'd want to do that and you want to do it by keeping things as clear as possible through the, through the development process so that it's clear when you hand this over what pieces are completely given with unlimited rights and what pieces you might be able to restrict the rights with and we'll get into that as well. Okay, so just a, four, uh, a few instances where unlimited rights, um, the government's going to take unlimited rights is where the data is developed exclusively at government expense. I'm going to talk about that next, um, but also form fit function technical data. 
the government will also take unlimited rights uh, in computer software documentation that's required to be delivered under the contract. This includes things like the owner manuals um, and other kind of written documentation. And, and form, form, fit, and function data is, is always given with un, like all of these things on this slide are always given with unlimited rights. And form, fit, and function is something the government can try to use sometimes as a catch-all to get certain rights for items. Um, but it's important to know what the limits on form, fit, and function are. And so if it's, for instance, if it's some sort of like source code, right, the source code has nothing to do with form, fit, and function data. The source code is um, something that if you developed at private expense and you give it to the government, they have, they have no rights to that. Or the sort of inner workings of how a particular product might work. If you have some sort of proprietary technology um, with that, that you've developed, uh, say, I don't know, some sort of thermographic imaging camera or something like that, and it's, it's how it works is something proprietary. Form, fit, and function is the information they might need to fix certain things or get replacement parts, you know, what size screws they need for certain things, that sort of information. It's not specifically how to replicate the chip or something that's proprietary in that item. That would be something you could retain. So, But the government sometimes can try to stretch the form, fit, and function idea uh, a little bit broader than maybe it should be. So it's just important to understand what the, uh, what the boundaries of that are so you don't get caught in a situation where you're being asked to give away more than you, sh more than you should be. And also, when you're dealing with computer software documentation, make sure that it's whatever documentation or owner's manual you're giving has... It's just something you'd be able to give to the public, and it doesn't get into the minutia of anything you consider proprietary, because if it does, even though you might have restricted rights in the software you're developing or you're, you're giving to the government, uh, the documentation will be given with unrestricted rights. So make sure the documentation um, is, is free and clear of any of that information. Okay, so just to finish up what we started here about the questions that we ask as part of the analysis and looking at these issues. Um, the final thing is how was the data developed? Um, how was that funded? Um, because as we've already been just, uh, talking about here, if you have government funding, they're going to get more rights. It's best if possible to develop your core components internally in-house with private expense before the government contract and with your own private funds. If developed before government contract, before that work is awarded, and financed without any direct government funding, then the government is going to have the fewest rights, as we've just been describing, limited rights in technical data and restricted rights in software. Yeah, and that's, whenever, again, when we're talking about development, that's a very particular word. And development, it means at the lowest practicable level, so if you have, if you're preparing um, software, for instance, and you have some source code that you're developing, if the source code that you've developed at private expense or you know, outside of the federal contract uh, can be can be identified to so up to lines, you know, code lines one through seven thousand, those lines of code were all developed to yourself, and seven thousand and one and then maybe interspersed here and there, were all developed uh, with maybe government funds. To the extent that those first 7,000 lines of code can do something, that it actually does something it was meant to achieve, then that would be um, the lowest level where you could segregate those 7,000 lines of code and say that is a particular item that we have developed because it is capable of, of running a program and doing something or with just very little things here and there, it can be created to do something. Then at that point, you put a box around that and you you can restrict the rights in that item, even though maybe the government wants a program that does what the 7,000 lines does plus a bunch of other things, at least you can restrict the rights in that piece of it, which also gives you uh, the benefits down the line because if the 7,000 pieces of code are actually integral in the 
in running the rest of the program. And it's really a found, those 7,000 lines of code is really a foundation. You can restrict the rights to use that foundation. And therefore the government might have unlimited rights in the other pieces of source code. But because those other pieces of source code build upon the foundation in which you created a private expense, then you can effectively limit the ability of the government or other contractors to get access to the entire program. Um, and that's just an example from the software development side, but you know there are other things like that as well. So if you have a widget that you develop that's integral that goes in this bigger item, you can limit, you can take rights in the technical data for that widget, um, the pat whether it's patent or copyright and other things, you can take the rights in that widget and then if the government tries to give it to someone else, they have to give it to someone else without that widget, which the whole thing might not work in that case. And so um, it's just important to keep good records when you're preparing these things so you can make affirmative statements and prove it because the burden would be on you to prove that it can be segregated where the segregation occurs and uh, what your basis for the segregation is, i.e., was it done completely a private expense? When was it done? Do you have records to prove that it was done in sort of your labs uh, and not part of the contract? So uh, you want to keep good records as you're going through with these things. Right. So that's getting into some of the other considerations and other issues that we just wanted to raise and mention, and we assume you're going to have a lot of questions about, too. Um, for example, your relationship if you're a prime and a subcontractor. Uh, if the subcontractor, for example, has limited rights data, the subcontractor can bypass the prime and give the data directly to the government. Um, the prime should contract with the subcontractor to use the data to the extent necessary uh, for the prime to perform the contract. Um, but if the subcontractor's efforts are used and privately funded, Prime should definitely consider having separate subcontract agreements and include works made for higher provisions. In other words, for anything that's developed by the sub during performance of the contract, you want to make sure you have works made for higher provisions that provide the Prime will get ownership or rights uh, in what was developed. So these are we're giving these as some samples, um, examples of different kinds of issues uh, that can come up relating to your Prime subcontractor relationships when it involves data rights. And remember here too, the, the by dole Act that we talked about earlier. So with regard to the last bullet here about the works made for higher provisions, um, if your subcontractor happens to be a small business, then you cannot force these things upon them. Um, you can you know, suggest or you can essentially say that um, you're only taking bids from people. If you're the prime, you're only taking bids from subcontractors who, who um, will sort of waive rights or, or give all the rights necessary to the prime. Um, that's okay. And it's, it's sort of a, it's a very fuzzy line under the buy dole Act uh, versus sort of general commercial practice of works made for hire. Well, when does a works made for hire provision or requirement turn into uh, sort of an, an improper uh, control by a prime over a small business sub? It's really not clear, um, but you can't, for instance, you can't hold them under under duress or refuse to pay them on other contracts, you know, th things of that that nature. For try to force them to sign it, but you can put it in generally. And subcontractors, small business subcontractors, can certainly give up their rights if if they wish to do so. Um, one other thing, there's definitely there's the the DFAR does suggest that the uh, prime contractor should. Uh, pass flow down the appropriate clauses directly to the sub to not give the sub privity of contract. You're not going that far, but at least with regard to license rights, uh, allow the subcontractor to provide the license directly to the government. So that's just something to pay attention to. It's it's suggested. It's not required, but it's it's just suggested that that's the way things uh, should should work. So just keep that in mind as you're negotiating things and going forward. Another consideration we just wanted to add a caution about is your legends and markings uh, that you'll find in your contracts. Use only the legends provided in your particular data rights clause um, in the contract. This is not a time to be creative. 
use exactly what's provided in your contract um, because failure to do so can lead to um, inadvertently relinquishing some of your rights. So it's very important that you try and adhere to exactly what's provided for in your contract. Yeah, and with regard to um, the particular legend, in the data rights clauses, whether it's the FAR or the, the DFAR clauses, it will tell you, assuming you're looking at the correct clause, which is why the nomenclature and everything is important, whether it's restricted or it's you know limited rights or government purpose, if you get the you have to look at the right legend and include that. But that doesn't apply to commercial, just like we said before. So if it's commercial software, commercial items, the license that the government would take would be the same license that you would give to any any standard commercial buyer. Um, generally speaking. And then when you're talking about unjustified and non-conforming markings, an unjustified marking is something where if it's uh, an item that should really be unlimited rights and you're attempting to limit it by putting uh, a, a legend on there or if it's a commercial item, you're attempting to put some sort of, uh, your, own, of your own legend or marking on it, the government can actually do one of two things. They can simply ignore it. If it this is unjustified. They can simply ignore it and move forward uh, as if it was unrestricted. Or what they can do is they can remove the legend if it's something, really this applies if it's like an actual item. Um, they can actually get the item removed, the legend rather, removed from the physical um, item it's been placed on and charge you for that. With regard to non-conforming markings, for instance, if you've attempted to put some sort of, of your own legend on there that doesn't conform with the FAR, the contracting officer or the DFARS, the contracting officer is supposed to give you 60 days to correct that. They're supposed to notify you of it and give you 60 days to correct it. If you fail to correct it, then it reverts to unlimited rights. So sometimes people, I've seen people get into disputes about whether or not some legend should actually be uh, a restricted rights legend or if it should be government purpose rights or something to that effect, and there can be a dispute about that. Uh, you want to be aware of whenever you're informed of the government's view that it's non-conforming, you mark that on the calendar and you mark the 60 days on the calendar so that you know uh, what your, your time frame is. You need to kind of get this thing ironed out or you might want to think about taking some other action before you hit that 60 days, whether it's going up the chain of command, uh, trying to go the political route, or, uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, trying, trying to fi file some sort of injunction or, or something like that, which can be problematic because some of these disputes would fall under the Contract Disputes Act, and there is no injunctive relief under the Contract Disputes Act. So it's really something, uh, it's really something that you need to deal with up front to the maximum extent possible before you even sign on to contracts to make sure that everyone's on the same page with what the markings are supposed to be and what the contract requires. And one other uh, final point that we wanted to bring to your attention is just maintaining good records. So I touched upon this a little bit earlier. It's really important to keep track of the development um, of this data. When was it developed? In other words, when did it become workable? Um, was that before or during performance of your contract? What data was developed? Was it developed in-house or was it developed under the contract because the government asked you to tweak something and make um, some sort of uh, new part or change to your software? Um, and how was that data development funded? Was it done at your expense or was it done um, at the government's expense or a mix of both? So maintaining records of all of this is really, really critical, um, as it is for all intellectual property development, um, but particularly here with respect to uh, the data and what we've been describing um, during the rest of the program. Yeah, and when we were talking about the uh, non-conforming um, legends or we're talking about the uh, unjustified legends, that also uh, directly interfaces with this key of maintaining records because you're going to have to prove to the contracting officer that um, the legend is correct and they're going to want to see 
because they're going to officially challenge you or they could there's also something called a pre-challenge notification but generally the result for the contractor is the same you have to prove with all the documentation you can muster that you did develop this either at private expense outside of the federal contracts um, if it was something where you were running parallel to a federal contract yeah, that it, all the expenses were to your indirect cost pools none of it not even a dollar was in your direct labor pools um, those are the types of things you're going to have to prove and so timing of development is key whenever you reduced it to the lowest practicable level um, I can't stress that enough because if you get to the point where you've almost completed something and then you've actually developed it under a federal contract if you don't have the proper records to show whenever pieces were quote unquote developed you know when it became workable at the lowest practicable level which goes back to that 7000 lines of code example I used earlier if you never kept track of when you got to that 7000 lines of code and you just kept going to 7001 2 3 4 5 um, the government can then say, well, you don't have any proof that this was developed at private expense. Um, you you might have started working on something. You might be able to prove you started working on it, but it wasn't developed. And that's the key of when it was developed. And so the government can try to take all the rights in that. Um, so it's just something to to really think about uh, whenever you're you're putting these, whenever you're doing work on items you're spending your R&D dollars in certain ways that you keep sort of meticulous track of when things are being created, developed, so that if it ever comes up, you can point to specific points in time and or, and or segregate certain pieces of the larger product uh, to say, well, this piece does X, this piece does Y, those are independent items and sure, they're all part of, let's say you have a, a tire and a steering wheel, it's all part of a car, right? Well, the tire in and of itself does something in particular. Once the tire is done, it can roll, and that's what it's meant to do. So as soon as the tire is capable of rolling, that tire has been developed. The steering wheel, it's meant to do something, let's say it fits in some certain hand and it has different controls on it. Once you've created that, that is an independent item. You don't have to wait till the whole car is done in order to mark when you're done with the product. So make sure that you're um, keeping track of every little piece. And even like with the steering wheel example, that's not even the lowest practicable level or even the tire because you've got maybe the rubber has a certain makeup that you've developed. Maybe the steel on the inside of the tire is a special or the mesh, the way the mesh is laid out is something proprietary or even beyond that. Maybe the metallurgy you've used to craft the metal interior of the tire is something. So break it down to the lowest possible level and, make, and keep track of when each level has done something that's fit for any sort of purpose. And if you track it that way, you can then defend your rights and ownership in these things at the, broadest, uh, at the broader level whenever the government is trying to assert rights or whenever you get into a discussion about rights. Okay, let's see here. We've got some questions in here. Okay, that we have a few minutes left, so we'll start looking at some of your questions. Yeah, one one person's asking about margin rights and um, when the government would exercise margin rights. Generally, okay, the margin rights are really uh, in the context of patents in particular. Um, and we were thinking about uh, doing an entire section on, on patent rights as well. But what, what basically happens is if there's certain, if you develop something that is a, of a particular use and you have, a, you have a, a patent on it or you're almost ready to develop a patent on it, the government can come in and sort of assert its rights over that patent and still has to pay you for it. But it's something where the government can essentially take it if they've paid for it and now generally you see this occurring oh and there are also certain items where they sort of automatically have that um, that is more limited though you're talking about 
like uh, the nuclear um, engines and things like that for aircraft carriers, you, you're never going to have the patent right for that. Because that's something where even though you might be developing it and generally all these rules give you the rights to certain items or generally it gives you the rights so that you have ownership and you can go do things with it, certain items like nuclear technologies, um, certain maybe highly proprietary technologies, things that are very, uh, you know, hush-hush, uh, certain um, like stealth technologies, th th things like that, that are highly classified or not to get out, you're never actually going to get the rights in that. And that's that's most of the time where you see some of the margin rights and other things uh, occur. Uh, it can occur outside of that, but it's relatively, relatively rare. Um, and I can get more into that uh, sort of sort of offline. Yeah, I'll, f I'll follow up. And then so regard to we have another question about SBIR d data rights and how it all fits together. SBIR, the SBIR program and the data rights given in the SBIR program are uh, separate. Um, they have their own clauses and things like that. And it works in a, a similar way, but they can be more restrictive. Um, just because of the way the, the program is put together. And when you get towards the, the later phases of SBIR development, then it's more similar. Um, but that's something I could get into that as well. I'll, I'll make sure we follow up uh, directly and I can give probably some, some better information um, offline on things. Um, and then generally, another question about private expense. Whenever you're dealing uh, with things at, at private expense, uh, if if something is, let's see, if something is separated from your your GNA pools, if if the if it's in the GNA cost pool, so anything that's in your indirect. Even if it's spread across or over your direct cost, like for instance GNA, you multiply it by your by your direct cost in order to get your GNA for the various um, you know contracts you're working on. If it's if it's in your indirect, if it's in an indirect cost pool, the way that like a GAAP would consider it like an actual or CAS if you're under under the cost accounting standards, if it's if it's in if the Money for that is is in an indirect cost pool, and it doesn't spill over to your direct bill rates. Then that's where um, you you would be able to take limited rights or assert rather uh, extra rights and give the government limited rights in those items. So just because it's in GNA doesn't necessarily mean that um, it would it would automatically open you up to unlimited rights just by virtue of the fact that GNA is spread over your direct costs. It could still be considered limited rights. Um, let's see here. Another question. <laughs> That's a very long question. Um, Okay, there's another question. How does the prime contractor properly assert data rights when a subcontractor ha has them when we're filling out reps and certs? Okay, well, if that's – this is like a, a tricky issue. So if, if the prime contractor, you're certifying that you have all the rights necessary to, to give it to the government. If the subcontractor has those rights and they're not willing to give it to you, and you're sort of okay with that because you need the subcontractor, you can actually certify that you can provide the rights so long as you have an agreement in place with the sub so that they will pass the rights directly to the government. The only thing the government necessarily cares about when you're doing certain reps and certs and things like that is, are you go is the government going to get the rights delivered to it that it's paying for and that it deserves? So they don't necessarily care that it comes directly from the prime. Generally speaking, this is not true with other things, but when you're talking about data rights, you're, you're given a little bit of extra leeway. So even though the government has no privity with the sub, because of the Buy Dole Act and, and uh, the general policies behind the data rights, the sub can actually give them directly to the government 
and you can still certify to the gov the prime can still certify to the government that it has the capability to deliver everything required and that it is delivering everything required. Um, it, it's probably a good idea to mention that uh, to the to the contracting officer and the specialists and everyone you're working with as you're going through things to in, ensure that they know that that's how things are being done and that with regard to the specific rights and specific items and things like that that you're passing it through directly um, ju just so that it, it's made clear. Uh, also with regard to the slides, yeah the the slides will be available. They're available for um, I think you can download it if you look in the what is this little the um, pop-up that you have on your screen there should be a, an item there called handouts if you open that up you can actually download it directly from there it'll also be available on our website and this entire presentation will be posted on YouTube as well so on our YouTube channel and you can kind of go back and see it whenever you want to so it'll, it'll all be available there um, Next, let's see, if the government has unlimited rights to something for which they paid for the development and the contractor retains ownership, can the contractor sell the same item commercially and set the commercial price for that item as it chooses? The answer is yes. So if just because the government takes unlimited rights in an item, that does not impact the contractor's ability to market, sell, distribute, modify, uh, re restrict rights, vis-a-vis -vis other parties, um, meaning commercial parties, you can do all of that because the ownership rights stay with you. Um, and this is actually a good point that we forgot to mention before is that the idea of incohate rights isn't something in the FAR or the DFARS. It's where if the government asks for, um, they, they produce a certain contract, you start developing something and the government has taken unlimited rights in an item, but they don't actually require a deliverable. So the they'll say they need some software, but they don't require the source code to be a deliverable under the contract. Then in theory, the government has unlimited rights in that code, but it doesn't actually have the code. So those are what we call incohate rights because they're, they're real rights, but the practical impact is, is um, that it's, it's, it's sort of an in, ethereal, intangible right because you don't have the item. It's similar to if you paid Microsoft for a license of, of uh, Windows 10 and you didn't actually get the software or you never, you never asked them for the software, you just paid them for a license to use the software and let's say you had no internet connection and you know you didn't have the CD or any means of getting it, then what you've essentially done is you have rights to use something, but you don't have it. And so in that sort of case, if the government attempts to acquire the source code later or if it asks you to deliver it, you can essentially charge whatever you want, even to the government, so long as you're not classifying it as some sort of... Um, license fee or anything like that. If you're making it clear that just for a physical copy of the item, it'll cost you, you know, a thousand dollars for one physical copy of this software, fine. As long, you know, they might try to say you're trying to charge a license fee, but there's nothing illegal about charging whatever the market will bear for a certain item, both in the commercial realm and even in the, the uh, public sector realm, if you're selling back to the government, so long as you're not charging a license fee. So that's just something that can be important to, to keep in mind as well. And I think we're about out of time. So thank you again, everybody, for attending. Uh, there's a couple of questions we didn't get to. We'll, uh, we'll go through after the webinar, reach out to people directly or give some more information. And to the extent anyone has any other questions, we'd be happy to, to talk to you, talk it through either Kimmy or my, myself. Uh, I think our contact information is in here. Um, so feel free to reach out and thank you very much.